good afternoon friends uh, welcome to another webinar of iags and this is a unique webinar because this is first time uh, so many things are happening first time today the journal of minimal access surgery popularly known as jmas is conducting a training program or basically a orientation program on basic medical writing skills and this program is being conducted by dr anil sharma dr uh, dr sandeep agrawal and this is basically to to create awareness about how to write why to write and to share the techniques and another first is that this is the first time the jmas editors and indian journal of surgery these are two major publications from india and their editors are sharing a stage together and this is also to emphasize the point that how important this is that both the editors have decided to be together to help create awareness about this particular issue uh before we talk about the topic i would welcome our senior past president of iags and an advisor and see very well known dr pradeep chobe sir to to who is also the chief editor of this journal uh, jmas i like inaugurate this and to say a few words yeah uh, th uh, thank you uh, very much raman and uh, very uh, very uh, greatly appreciate your leadership and also your presidentship for ijs and giving a new direction and new shape to the way we are uh, thinking and i'm sure it has the this particular platform also has added and also reduced your travel otherwise you would have been gone crazy and uh, i welcome you all uh, for this uh, uh, webinar which is very interesting uh, webinar and i'm glad that sandeep is also there and uh, uh, this will uh, provide lot of synergy to the uh, indian academics and more so the indian subcontinent academics and at the helm of affairs we have got great uh, academician which are uh, known for their publication known for their inclination of medical writing and also they had had that uh, professorial uh, sort of uh, positions which uh, encouraged medical writing we all know it goes without saying that today more and more uh, evidence based uh, uh, practices are uh, taking shape and uh, coming in the forefront and those whims and fancies of the surgeons and the medical profession is gradually gradually disappearing however we have to be a little careful uh, what we speak and what we uh, follow and uh, definitely if it is supported by the uh, medical uh, uh, opinions and also the evidence based medicine uh, the legal issues are also taken care of because we know that the patient uh, community is becoming more and more litigant so the first step of uh, having uh, this is how to do uh, medical writing what what are the principles of uh, medical writing how it should be written how it should be projected how should it be published and uh, some of our colleagues uh, have been doing this in the past on a different platform but today i am very happy that uh, we are doing our first course and as raman has said it's a quite an, an important uh, meeting today where two journals and their editors are coming together and our interested Uh, young population also should understand that medical writing is very important publication is has has become an integral part of your future plans unless you purely wants to go into uh, uh practice private practice but any position post progress depends on your medical publication so i welcome you all and i will uh, with my best wishes i will hand it over to um, Uh, dr sandeep and dr anil sharma uh, for conducting these courses and uh, uh, sort of letting our youngsters know i'm sure we will have quite a few more courses in the future 
but uh, uh, congratulations to all and uh, thank you raman for providing this leadership to the to the young and not so young uh, colleagues of our in india and across the south indian subcontinent thank you sir thank thank you dr chauhi sir uh before we move on to the academic component i welcome dr sandeep kumar uh, uh who is the editor of indian journal of surgery uh he is a past uh, professor ex professor of kg kgmc lucknow and five founder director of all india institute of bhopal so uh, i request dr sandeep kumar to to say a few words about today's topic and its relevance uh, raman Raman, I will just interrupt on the lighter side. Yeah. When in '95 we had the Congress, uh, first IJS Congress, and yes. Sandeep may or may not remember, and day one was the uh, workshop in All India Institute, and Sandeep was the first person entered for registration. So congratulations, and Sandeep, it <laughs> gives us so much. I remember. Very active member, and I really enjoy reading the journal. and uh, now you the editor in chief and i am the editor in chief for indian general surgery so let's join hands to do this workshop thank we you we are always together thank you and thank you dr raman goel uh, <clears throat> only lately i discovered that dr goel comes from mathura and uh, both of us have common family links and things so i'm very grateful i'm very happy here to be on this forum thank you dr raman goel for inviting me to be a part of uh, uh you know moderator here dr anil sharma namaskar and sandeep agrawal cause i know him since uh, his formative day, days and uh, dr kritika uh, good afternoon and, and delhi is not too far from mathura <coughs> it is not of course you can so uh, today is a very very important uh, uh, workshop and i have been asked by uh, the senior moderator dr raman goel to say a few words in brief uh introducing these this uh, little workshop or whatever you may call it a webinar on writing skills now when we talk about writing skills we talking of scientific writing now scientific writing is of two types uh, only lately as an editor i received an article on on hemorrhoids and it was a nicely written article quite a good nice english but the reviewer very nicely came out with the comment great article for a newspaper not fit for indian journal of surgery so uh, scientists are <clears throat> writing two types of articles one is as a visible scientist article paul ehrlich was one scientist who was a visible scientist to make the science visible to the layman to the lay press which is understandable we all write small booklets in our clinic explaining people what lymphoma is and what obesity surgery is and we write articles in lay press for lifestyle changes and explaining the disease and that is a part of an ardent duty in today's world of covid pandemic we are all writing articles for the lay press so that's one thing and probably the and dr goel will correct me the objective of this writing skills workshop is not to talk about those articles but to talk about structured articles that we write and try and publish in the bio medical scientific journals for the in house consumption of the scientific community am i right sir yes yes sir absolutely so we all know that this kind of an article is a structured article very back 100 years ago when lancet and bmj were the first biomedical journal and the first biomedical journal which was published from vienna did not have a structure and people had a story way of telling and which was perfectly okay i mean that was anecdotal and story way of telling science that how they discovered something how they made an invention whether it was pure science or medical science but then then the this inrad module came where we have to have an introduction uh <clears throat> then we have to have an abstract which is structured and then we have a material and method and then we have to have results and calculations which is called um, um uh, uh, data analysis and discussion and references so mm -hmm. that is the structure that we follow and it is an important structure 
So articles, as you know, are of many types, which the, the speakers will allude upon. I have, I'll just finish by saying why it is important to be writing scientific articles. For the lay press, yes, but why in the scientific journal when uh, of late there has been some criticism of the way the some of the articles got published in very major journals and those were criticized. So um, uh, they say if you can if you can acquire skills, then you can continue to perform those skills whether they are benefiting the person or not. So you have to have tools to assess that whatever uh, uh, you are giving as we as surgeons because we basically surgeons are actually uh, showing our uh, mechanical skills, surgical skills, which have a potential danger of harming somebody or if not harming, doing, uh, may not be benefiting. So there will always be a competition with the, with the available medical treatment or a different surgical treatment. So there are these issues of comparison, which is better, which is better on a population base, which is better and when is it better? What parameters would make it better? And that becomes the need of writing a scientific article. And those becomes the study variables. So when you can do something, you're great. It's nice. You get popular people come to you. Patients come to you. You are a popular doctor. You start earning money. And you have a comfortable living. You and I start teaching and professing. Become teachers. But as teachers, you can always say something. Maybe with, during the last five minutes, I've said something which may not have been correct. And I can always go back and say that, no, I didn't mean this, I meant this. But when you start writing it, my professor used to say it, that if you can do it, then the higher portion is you can teach it and the, or you, and the highest is that you can write it. When you write it, he would say, Safed Syaha ho gaya. You have made it into white and black. And now you cannot rub it. Somebody else will rub it and say, this was not correct and this was probably uh, incorrect. So once you start writing it, you have umpteen number of chances of editing yourself and getting it edited by peers. And then what comes out is really a very balanced thing and probably the best of your life in for that particular research question. And that is why I think, and I think I'll finish stop here, why this writing skills workshop is extremely important. It is a learned activity. You can write good flamboyant English or Hindi, but Writing scientific uh, journal articles is a learned skill. You are not born with it. That's all I would like. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. I think that was quite enlightening. You know, just to be on the lighter side, one of my friend, uh, a surgeon himself wrote today that good, this you are doing this course, people will have a better handwriting. So, so you know, the, uh, writing, medical writing can be interpreted in many ways. So moving on with our first talk today, I invite uh, Dr. Anil Sharma, who is Director of Endo Hernia Surgery at Max Hospital Healthcare at Saket, New Delhi. I, a, a senior man who has been associate editors of many, many journals and is also the editor of Journal of Minimal Access Surgery. I welcome him to speak on why write or publish. And friends, uh, please keep sending your questions. After every talk, we'll have a question answer session uh, so that so that uh, uh, as we move on today, we have five talks. Uh, we will be able to take questions relevant to the topic immediately after talk. Dr. Sharma, please. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so I'd first of all like to thank the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, led by our president, Dr. Raman Goel. Uh, to facilitate uh, the online presentation of this course. Uh, some of you may, may be aware that this course has been around for about seven years, but now this course has a, a title and this course has a purpose. So from now on, this course would, would be known as the JMAS Medical Writing Course. Can I share my screen, please? Right, I want to go to one, which is this one. So just a few thoughts about why write, publish.
Right. So you got my screen? Yes. Okay. So right at the outset, I would like to start off by saying that this is not a professional course for the purist. This is a course that has been designed by practicing surgeons for the benefit of practicing surgeons who wish to, to write and publish surgical articles in peer-reviewed journals. Oh, in fact, uh, this is a course that, that was born from discontentment, from frustration at the lack of knowledge and the lack of basic information to uh, write and publish effectively. So there is a passion, there is a sense of purpose that drives this course. But apart from that, there is no other conflict of interest. So not so long ago, surgeons used to be regarded as, as cowboys because uh, they, they believed mainly in action. There was no time for, for reflection, for contemplation, for audit. And like the Prof. Sandeep Kumar just mentioned, you know, I was in fact, again, not so long ago, trained in one of the finest medical colleges in Bombay. And there used to be a dictum at that time that said that those who can do, those who cannot teach, and those who can neither do nor teach, write. But times have changed since then and how. So we now have dictums that tell us publish or perish, publish and flourish. In fact, in these times of, of social media and information overload, things have become so bad that now we have dictums that say post or perish, and if you don't yell, you won't sell. So the, the role of a surgeon has changed as well over the decades and the years, and the surgeon now finds himself in the role of a thinker and a teacher as well, apart from, from being a doer. So I don't need to, in fact, tell you about the need to write and publish it in today's day and age, because we all know it is so important for, for our professional advancement. But we'd just like to point out that the grants for research funding come to those departments, those institutions that have a track record of medical writing and publishing. But apart from that, it's also about personal growth. You know, there, uh, uh, there is a big mismatch today between what we can do and what we can write. In fact, there, there, there is a very big lacuna that exists today in the world as far as surgical literature from, from the subcontinent is concerned. So by writing, you can make that little contribution to your profession. In fact, writing and publishing is, is just like an act of creation because you create intellectual property that, that would be preserved down the ages. The written word reaches the widest audience and constitutes the archival message. So like Prof. Sandeep Kumar was, was saying just a few minutes ago, if you want to get to the bottom of your subject, the bottom of your topic, start to write about it. 
So why do some countries publish more than others? Of course, you know, it is research funding that, that drives much of publications throughout the world. But then, like I said, you know, it's a cat and mouse game. You, you start to write and publish and you start getting grants for, for research funding to write more. And of course, proficiency in the English language. And my feeling is that we, we here in this country have a significant advantage with the language. Now, there has been a subtle shift, a subtle but a definite shift in the way that we write, in the way that, that we publish, and finally, in the way that, that we are read. So about 25 years ago, till about 25 years ago, surgeons used to write articles which used to get published in these paper journals. And these paper journals constituted prime source of surgical information. But then that changed with, with the advent of the World Wide Web. And now content from these paper journals started to get stored in large online repositories like, like PubMed. So the final destination of your article today is not the paper journal, but large online resources like PubMed, like Cochrane, Medline, and so on and so forth. So what that practically means now is that, that where you publish does not make that much of a journal, that, that much of a difference. Which journal you publish does not make that much of a difference. Because finally, now the, the chances are that your article would be read online. And when that happens, we, we know that the online content is far more important than the online source. So I call this democracy in medical publishing. But then mind you, certain things will remain in place. There, there are going to be certain minimum standards required for medical publishing, and there is going to be peer review in place for, for quite some time to come. So when a person really desires something, the entire universe conspires to, to help that person to realize his dream. So if, if I have permission, I may move to my second presentation. Is that okay? And then we, we can have discussion following my second presentation. Is that okay, Mr. Chairperson, sir? Please go ahead, sir. Right. So I am now going to speak on what to write. Okay. So there we go again. So starting from the, the most simple to the most difficult, you know, starting from the easy to the more complex, starting from the lower levels of evidence to progressively uh, higher levels of evidence. This is what constitutes surgical writing and publications. The letter to the editor, the case report, the surgical technique, which, which is also known as how I do it, the case series, the case control study, the, the cohort study. Now the case series, the case control study and the cohort studies, these, these are known as non-randomized observational studies, because in these studies, you don't have a randomized control group, which means that in these studies, you, you don't have a control group that is similar to the patients that are being treated. 
the randomized control trial, and then we have narrative reviews, systematic reviews, Cochrane reviews, meta-analysis, and finally, editorials. So uh, the case series, the case control study, the, the cohort study, and the randomized control trials constitute what are known as the original articles. Now, these normally constitute about two-thirds of the content of a surgical journal. And, and, this is, uh, and these are the articles that, that provide uh, uh, the prime content that would establish the journal's reputation for quality. And then we have review articles, which is about one or two or three per issue. The, and, and these are the, the form of review articles. And we'll try and, and go through these one by one. So, so when you have decided you want to write, when, when, whenever there is a prospective study about to be done, what needs to be done? You, First of, the first of all, need to, to uh, fill up your study protocol or your research protocol. Now, this is a standard document that, that needs to be uh, all teaching hospitals in the country today. Uh, the study protocol is filled up, is submitted to uh, the local institutional review board, you get consent from there, and your, your trial also needs to be registered at the Clinical Trial Registry of India, at, or there, there are some, some other trial registries where, where you can register your trial. And what does this, this study protocol comprise of? You know, these are the things that are part of the study protocol. Why you want to do the study? what sort of a study design this is, how will you select participants, what are you going to do to, to those participants, what sort of an intervention would, uh, would you plan for, for these participants, what parameters would, would you study in these participants, what are the safety factors that that you have taken into account to make sure that your participants are safe. And of course, statistics, what, what sort of, of statistics would be used. And then we have participant rights and, and committees. So this constitutes a standard study protocol, which should be there in all teaching hospitals. So you don't write because you want to say something. You write because you have something to say. And then when you have something to say, the shorter, the better. Okay, please remember publication space comes, comes at a premium. But then more importantly, uh, uh, the, the sort of time factor that uh, uh, the, the the so-called attention time span of readers now is very finite. It comes at a premium. So you have to be short and concise. The letter to the editor, you know, just saying that, that, that I read a, a one particular article, it was very good, will not land you anywhere. When, when you write a letter to the editor about an article that has to, to have something that will contribute to, to, to a, that particular article. You know, perhaps something that, that the authors have not stressed upon or something they, they, they did not mention or something that you still feel may not be appropriate. So the good whole, the, the, the good old humble case report uh, uh, but Deep Raj is actually going to, to speak about this in time to come, so, so I'll be very brief over here. Now, just because you have seen 
something rare that does not constitute a case report. It should be something that has that has not been described before, or some sort of a presentation that is not usual. Maybe a new treatment, a new sort of modality of doing things, or or something unique to a rare situation that constitutes a case report. Now, the surgical technique beat, or uh, or like I said, th th this is also known as the how I do it technique. Now, in this bit, you can look at small portions of the operation. You, you don't have to, in fact, talk about the, the entire operation. You can talk about some bits of the operation that, that make the operation simpler or, uh, or you, know, you think it makes that part of the surgery safer or better for the patient in some way. So when you talk about surgical technique and, and when you want to, to, to report about surgical technique, you, you can, in fact, just talk about one part of the surgical procedure as well. Please remember. So a case series then. Now, a case series, of course, constitutes a non-randomized observational study. And a, a case series basically follows a group of patients who, who have a similar diagnosis or undergo the same surgical procedure. Okay, very straightforward. For example, the initial experience with the ETP approach for large complex inguinal hernias. Now, now, when you when you talk about case series, you are basically talking about what you did and what you found. Out here in a case series, you can't compare one treatment with the other. You can just make some sort of general observations that that you found in your case series. Okay, so so be careful. There there is. You, 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 in fact, need to be quite, quite reserved about the conclusions that you can draw from a simple case series. Then, the, then comes the case control study, which, which is like we saw again, a non-randomized observational study. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't know if the, uh, Dr. Doyle has vomited. In uh, the case series, of course, is uh, wonderful. As you said, is uh, no comparisons. But case series actually is a cross-sectional study. And nested case control model can be done in a case series. In your own case series, long historical cohort or a case series, you may have, uh, you may have rendered two types of treatments. So within the case series, those two types of treatments, not as a trial situation, a nested case control study can be done and odds ratio or can be calculated. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so the, the, the case control study comes next. And uh, when we talk, talk about a case control study, what do we mean? When, when patients are selected once they have the target outcome or not, and researchers look backwards to try and find out factors of exposure. So what I mean is this, for, for example, incisional hernia rates following single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Okay, so, so, so incisional hernia rates following single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So you have, say, 100 patients that had undergone single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and 10 of them now have an incisional hernia. So you can, can talk about you know, those 10, the, the rest 90, and then try and look at factors that caused the incisional hernia. 
you know, perhaps length of the incision, perhaps uh, the, the, the well, manner of surgical closure, perhaps uh, the, the sort of suture that was used and so on and so forth. Then comes the, the cohort study, which is, uh, you know, a non-randomized observational study yet again. Now, when we talk about a cohort, we, this means patients that have a certain similar characteristic. So a cohort study you know, can happen when you have patients that are followed forward and assessed from the time of exposure until the time of consequences of exposure. And I'll tell you what I mean. So you have performed single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy on say 100 patients. And you have then decided that you will follow up these patients for, for the next one year or for the next two years and look for, for, for well, primary endpoints and secondary endpoints. For, for, for example, incisional hernias, for example, bile duct injury, for example, you know, other things. So that constitutes a cohort study. Then, of course, uh, the randomized control trial. Now, randomized control trials are done basically when, when investigators want to assess treatment, treatment uh, effects which they consider to be beneficial. For example, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the laparoscopic group, you know, the, the, the laparoscopic hernia group, say, say about 20 years ago, would want to prove that, it, that you have lower recurrence rates following laparoscopic hernioplasty than, than following Lichtenstein repair. And that, that can only be conclusively proved by a randomized control trial. Now, this is just a slide to, to I'll tell you that, that as far as the cohort and the case control studies are concerned, they are susceptible to bias. And so they have limited validity for the simple reason that you don't have a randomized control group to, to a compare your treatment results with. And that is why uh, uh, the, the randomized control trials are thought to be feasible and generalizable. So the advantages of a randomized control trial are, of course, that, that this constitutes level one evidence. It is useful to disprove efficacy. For example, uh, the internal mammary artery used to be thought of okay, as a very good graft to, to be used in a CABG till it was proved in a randomized control trial that that is not really the case. Uh, the orthopedic surgeons used to, to, to uh, perform arthroscopies uh, for arthritis. And that, that was again, you know, found to be useless in a randomized control trial. But then there are problems with a randomized control trial too. You know, there, there are in fact inherent problems about comparing surgical procedures. You know, surgical skill sets vary from one department to the other, from, from one hospital to the other, from one country to the other, then a blinding of the procedure from the assessor becomes very difficult at times because the, the person who, who in fact reads the results should not know which arm this patient belongs to. And that can, can become quite difficult at times. There are times where, when there are ethical issues that, that, are, that in fact become involved. So you, 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 you cannot perform randomized control trials in those sort of situations. 
So when we talk about uh, the original articles, by and large, these can be in fact classified in, into three types, the retrospective studies, prospective studies, and retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data, the so-called retro pro studies. And then we of course come to the reviews, but uh, this is not, this, this particular course will, will not touch much, much on the reviews because this talks about basic writing. But uh, the narrative reviews are those that, that have more of an individual touch to, you know, to them. Uh, these would be normally written by, by an expert who, uh, you know, would in fact summarize recent literature and talk about new developments for them from his personal perspective. The systematic reviews and the Cochrane reviews, they, they, are, they are much more rigorous compilations because you have very clearly defined search strategies. So these, these constitute uh, some high quality reviews, in fact. So when you talk about systematic reviews, basically at the end of the day, you want to do to, to a look at one specific clinical question. Okay, that is why you 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 in fact collect you know several articles, look at them, and uh, and perform a, a a critical appraisal, and then synthesize them together to try and find the answer to one specific clinical question. And meta the meta analysis is a type of systematic review that again uses statistical methods to summarize findings from, from several articles and, and, uh, and several analyses. And then finally, the editorials. Uh, this is again normally by invitation, where, uh, where an expert talks about some, some personal beliefs about uh, a specific research area. And uh, the best editorials are, are short and pertinent. And this, in fact, brings me to, 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 to another slide. Now, I'm no fan of Winston Churchill, but I sort of admire his wit. And he talks about a good speech, but these, the same thing, you know, can be, in fact, substituted to a, a good scientifically written surgical article. So it should be like a woman's skirt, he says, long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to create interest. So I'm showing you this slide just to, to invite, bring you, you back to the point that you need to be short, you need to be concise, you need to be lucid, whatever you write. So again, th this is what we have just looked at, starting from, from low levels of evidence going on to progressively higher levels of evidence. And this is uh, the Oxford 2011 levels of evidence table, which is, which is quite popular, that tells us that uh, uh, the the level one evidence comes from meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and well-conducted randomized controlled trials. Level two is cohort studies or low-quality randomized controlled trials. Level three is case control studies. Level four is case series, and level five is expert opinion. So to start with, what most people would suggest is you, you, you must start off, you know, quite humbly. Take, take small steps for a start. So to, to start off, perhaps the case report, the case series, and the how I do it segment would be the one to, to, to a target when you want to, to start writing surgical articles. 
the K series seems to be attractive because it's, this can be done fairly quickly. This can be done retrospectively. And the, the K series just talks about what you did and what you found. There is no question of patient selection, of, of uh, surgery selection, and this, that, and the other. But please remember, with a case series, you cannot compare two, two treatments to will say one is better than the other because like we had discussed, there is no control group in a case series. So the great leap of faith has to be taken uh, for you to uh, be on the other side and start producing some medical uh, papers and publications. Thank you for your attention for this segment. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, so uh, I think that it was very interesting to hear your uh, presentations. Uh, I started publishing in last 10 years majorly. And one of the reasons I, I, uh, I love publishing is because I find when you write an article and you audit your results, it's like seeing a mirror. Till you don't audit your results, you don't realize because you, you, you speak out what you remember. But when you go through your own data and you realize what is your mortality, what is your morbidity, and then suddenly you, you become quiet because now you know where you stand. Earlier it was, was very easy to comment on others' results, but once you started, so one of the major benefits of writing is that you, you learn to keep data securely, which is, which is a major concern with most of the surgeons in India who are not working in corporate hospitals. So I think thank you very much for emphasizing uh, how, what are the different types of publications that one can do. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Kumar, uh, uh, would you like to comment on it? And then we'll take a few questions. We have got a whole series of questions. Many of them are covering areas which will be discussed later today or tomorrow. So we are not going to take them. We'll just take the basic questions after Dr. Sandeep Kumar. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Sandeep, please unmute yourself. Let's take the questions. A brilliant talk by Dr. Anil Sharma. Thank you very much. You will have Thank you, sir. Well. Uh, just maybe a few things. Uh, uh, maybe I'll say it, say it at the end of the discussion. So for the sake of time, let's continue with the questions, Dr. Gwen. But very well done, sir. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Sharma, I think a, a, a good question is, I am a beginner. When I start to write good papers, how to begin? A beginner who wants to write good papers and where should he begin? Let, let Sandeep Agrawal answer that. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think uh, that's a good question and that's what Dr. Anil Sharma said in his last uh, slide. It's the best thing to start with the case report because uh, that's the simplest thing to write. Maybe not the easiest to publish, but to write, uh, it's, uh, you know, you need to have an uh, interesting case. You need to have all the imaging, all the material, and you need to do a good review of literature and you, you can quickly actually write in a day or two. I think you, you said it, Sandeep. You, yeah. Right, you have to be a voracious re reader. You've yeah. got to be reading. Yeah, yeah, the subject on which you want to write gives you a cake that this is something that you've done, probably should be brought to the notice of the scientific community. Read about it. Read your textbook first. Read an undergraduate book. Read a postgraduate type of a book. And search the literature. It's on, it's on the internet. Yeah. Read it and you will write it. So. Okay. All right, we have another question. Uh, basic question, is ethical clearance required for observational studies? Dr. Sharma? Yeah, certainly. You know, uh, now in fact, uh, what has happened is that we have uh, uh, something in place which are known as uh, uh, the COPE guidelines. Okay? And, and journals throughout the world follow the COPE guidelines. Uh, the COPE stands for for, in fact, uh, uh, the Committee on Publication Ethics. So, so they have a set of do's and don'ts which are, uh, uh, for all practical purposes, universally followed in most journals today. So there, there are very strong ethical uh, 
uh, sort of statements and issues that need to be followed when you, you in fact write scientifically. Very much so. I think recently government also has has made it much much uh, stricter that uh, any any study in India uh, we should have an ethical committee approval uh, for all the all all the organizations. Uh, I'll tell you why. See, yeah. when you publish uh, case series, I think that what was the question, Raman? The question was, Observe do we need studies. for observational studies? So that's that that's a very pointed question. Trial, everybody is sure, CTRI clearance, and you go for a trial, and you register a trial, and uh, unless you have a registered trial, you have a data monitoring board, etc., etc. Now, even a case, case report is an observational study. Case series is an observational study. And a cohort may not be an observational study because although you're not intervening much, but you are observing them at successive intervals. So, they who has the ownership on a historical case series? You come to the hospital, join as a young lecturer, or I join as a senior consultant, go to a corporate hospital, and I dig out the data from the electronic medical records or the physical record, and I start publishing it. So the ethic, you since you are not disclosing the identity of the patient, majority of the time the patient may not come into litigation because it, it is not really affecting them. So, but somebody who has the ownership of data, maybe the hospital maybe your predecessor, maybe some other senior or junior person. So that is the role of the ethical committee at that point in time. So why people have argued with me, why should I get an ethical clearance on an observational study? It, prove, it proves, the ethical clearance proves your ownership on the data because you're not publishing an anonymous article, you're publishing it in your name. Can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a couple of other issues. One is the anonymity of data. So even if it's an observational study, you need to anonymize the data. That's a crucial part. And obviously, uh, and, uh, you know, that's a, if you don't anonymize, then there is a possibility that patients' data might get you know uh, known to other people. So that's another aspect of an ethical clearance of an observational study. Yeah, Dr. Sandeep, uh, the, there, there is some change in uh, ethical clearance requirement in UK. For many observational studies, they have a different set of parameters where ethical committee requirement is no more there. And uh, those uh, recommendations are actually coming to IAGS soon to, to recommend it to the, to the government that, uh, that probably in certain categories of studies, uh, we, can, uh, we, should, we should actually uh, wave off the ethical committee. So this is a challenge in India because a lot of nursing homes and doc surgeons who are moving from place to place if they are operating in four hospitals, uh, where do they get ethical committee approval and how do they get it? So, uh, yeah, so, so, so for all practical purposes, Raman, you know, all major hospitals should, should have institutional review boards. And when they don't have these boards within their, their, their own premises, they can in fact take the services or of boards that, that, that are present around, maybe, you know, from a large public teaching hospital, for example. So you have review boards available that can do your job, you know, and, and that is something that, that needs to be gone through in today's day and world, like we'll see in the course ahead. Okay, I'll take one more question. There are many questions. We'll be taking each of those questions at, at a later time today itself. So one question is that I am writing an article from my thesis, which I wrote for my PG. Can I extract more than one article from one thesis? And can the title of the article be different from the thesis topic? Dr. Sharma? Yeah, so, so this is something known as salami slicing, as they say in the trade. And I think Deepraj will speak about this uh, a little more in detail. But then if you have uh, done a study, you know, in your thesis that has, uh, uh, for example, looked at two or three different but then related aspects, perhaps you, you, you can make three articles out of them subsequently. There, there, there is no problem like that. But then you have to be, you know, certain that that uh, that there is no no sort of conflict of interest, you know, in the sense that uh, that you you have 
a separate authorization for each segment you know of your study um, but uh, sandeep you want to add something you're saying yeah something? i would say certainly no period no you can't do it our uh, one thesis our post graduate thesis you can have only one paper because the study you have created is based on a single research question and uh, unlike a phd dissertation which lasts over 5 to 6 years where you have you know it's a much bigger project which has many you know verticals to it i would certainly say absolutely abstain from slicing in as you said salami slicing don't do it that's not taken kindly by the journals is considered a sort of a uh, misconduct and i would advise you against it that's Let's what i can say define salami slicing say if you have a case series in your thesis of one year or two years of md dm thesis and you have say 46 patients or maybe you have 120 patients and you've done two parameters two molecular markers and you want to publish both these molecular markers separately and correlate with the outcome which may be survival or something this is surely a salami slicing because it's the same cohort is the same case series but if you have examined maybe in a in a in a in a, in a as dr sandeep agrawal says in an exceptionally hard working thesis during your md or ms and you worked afterwards and you have a separate epidemiological data and 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 a separate molecular data maybe it may not qualify for a salami slicing and you may have a this so you really ask yourself am i really making uh, the two pieces of a cake or uh, i already baked two cases so you just have to see okay uh, dr sharma there is one more question which is more relevant to your second presentation can you please elaborate on the differences between systematic review and a meta analysis uh, you briefly mentioned it but uh, probably somebody wants uh, detail about this yeah so so a systematic review in fact looks at several articles you know to 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 a try and answer one clinical question so uh, uh there is there is actually a bit of an overlap be- between systematic reviews and meta analysis because because both of them look at several publications and try and condense and distill you know one answer or two or three answers but then pointed answers from from several publications that that that's all i can say you you have something to add sandeep yeah, yeah. so uh, i would say it is mostly right uh, i would say systematic reviews meta analysis uh, either so people either write a systematic review that is what uh, you look at the various studies so if five studies says a technique supports a particular result and six studies says doesn't support so you all sort of do a give a balanced view a meta analysis comes in when you take the data also so if you take the published data so the meta analysis can be from the published data or you can call up the author to get the raw data so it could be a raw data you know analysis from the authors all the authors or it could be the published data you take from the tables combine it create your own means standard deviations results so i think that a meta analysis is definitely certainly more difficult uh, and certainly if, uh, if there are lesser number of studies is futile to consider a meta analysis you need a good number of studies good quality studies especially rcts if preferably and if you think you want to do a further complex thing write an email to all the authors get their raw data combining so, combining data of homogeneous studies drawing out your own odds ratios hazards ratios is meta analysis and comparing studies randomized trials is systematic review so combining the data with new statistics is meta analysis comparing data and comparing rcts as per the protocol is systematic yeah thank you thank you dr sandeep kumar so i think before we uh, we quickly move on to the next uh, topic of the day but before i go to that since there are many pgs <coughs> here i would like to announce that iags from this year has started five research scholarships research project scholarships for pg students so those who are doing research in minimal access surgery 
five of them uh, uh, will be will be given a lakh of rupee so you can uh, you can make an application to iags with your research thesis and uh, it can, they will be evaluated another thing that we have done this year is a best original research publication jmas so if you are publishing in jmas you know, at the end of the year by end of december we will evaluate which was the best original publication and the the, the author will be awarded for that in the national conference and there is another award called best researcher award which is for the for the seniors so those surgeons who are in practice in job and who have multiple publications in any journal in the world which are effective publications they will be also awarded as the best researcher of the year and uh, so this is i thought this is an opportunity to to announce this again and we move on quickly to the next topic and uh, that is by professor sandeep agrawal uh, professor sandeep agrawal is a professor of surgery in all india institute delhi and he is a prolific surgeon uh, does lot of bariatric surgery and has a phenomenal number of publications to his credit so he is going to talk on developing a research idea into an article and dr sandeep agrawal has also taken over as the editor of jmas along with dr nil sharma sandeep thank you uh, dr goel for the introduction and i would like to also thank uh, dr sandeep kumar for uh, being a part of this course and uh, this course was being uh, run by uh, dr anil sharma and dr deepraj bhandarkar earlier and it is very nice of them for uh, them to allowing me in to this prestigious course and sharing my views uh so i'll be talking about this can i can you see my screen please Hello. yes indeed we can see that okay. okay so yeah so uh i'll be talking about developing a research idea into an article and when dr anil sharma gave me this topic he told me not to go by you know the cliched things about writing an article like the himrad or the other things but just to talk about generally in a very very simple language how to sort of go about starting a research i mean the topic itself is actually the whole workshop issue i mean it's obviously a huge topic and i would like to you know touch touch the various aspects of writing in this presentation and not go into details which are being covered by various you know in the other subsequent topics so once again thank you dr goel dr sandeep kumar dr anish sharma dr bhandarkar for giving me this opportunity so when you say convert a research idea into an article we all know this is not rocket science uh, dr anish sharma has already talked about why we need need to publish uh, in this current era uh, not only for the academic surgeons for also surgeons in practice who are doing a good volume of surgery for younger surgeons for anybody anybody who is you know interested in sharing their knowledge so we certainly know anybody can do it anybody can dance i mean it's, so it's not rocket science but it's not child play either so writing is something people say oh, oh he's just haven't got any job he keeps writing but it does take a whole lot of hard work i can tell you it requires persistence and self belief you know i can tell you from my own example my first article uh, got rejected by three journals before finally getting accepted in pediatric nephrology which is a better journal than the first all the first three journals put together and it was you know the support from my mentor initially who said no this is a good good report and it will be published i think the foremost thing which requires is honesty honesty as to the data honesty as to the actual operative findings no post operative outcomes and i i believe there's no need to be dishonest in any aspect because you're not going to gain anything by you know being dishonest just say what how things happen and what your data says because it's very important because when you share your knowledge and uh, to the with the world uh, you know you this uh, knowledge is going to be used by people and if you say something false it's only going to harm patients and somebody else is at and i would say a reasonable command over english language is not essential is probably uh, desirable uh, although one can use uh, you know professional help uh you know for correcting your manuscript but i think the first draft if you write it very badly it's difficult to correct and i keep telling it to my residents if you don't write the first draft carefully i will not give you the first option so what is it like uh, you know writing a scientific paper i i would say in spite of its structured uh, you know format is still write creating a story i still write like to call it creating a story 
uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, and I'll talk about it in the subsequent slide. Uh, so it, you know, it's, there should be a flow in it. Uh, that's the most important part of this writing. You can't just have one ideas being, you know, just being uh, sort of floated and, and thrown around without having a connection to each other or you know having a flow in the article. Uh, so what is the story about is it starts with the conceptualizing the research idea and I'll talk about it. Why I have put the second point in a bolder, uh, in a different color and a, a format is, is I think that's the, probably the most important part of uh, writing an article. Is the reading the relevant literature. Then comes the other parts, ethical clearance, the data collection, choosing an appropriate journal, organizing it into various sections, refining and I will not really go into details of each of this, but just say, you know, what is required for each of these uh, little, little sort of parts of writing an article. And when I say uh, research question, we are talking about people who are practicing surgeons or who are, when they were not going to design a prospective study. Here we are going to talk about uh, somebody has seen a, you know, an interesting case, they want to write a case report, or they do a, a good number of a particular surgeries and they want to uh, do a retrospective analysis. So I'll be basically focusing this on those sort of rather than designing a prospective study. This talk is not about, and this course is not about designing studies. So uh, what is the main thing in uh, research ideas? What do you want to say in the, your article? There has to be a loud message in your article that you have to be very clear what you want to say in your article. What is it? What is the question or concept you want to answer or what talk about? The primary outcome should be extremely, extremely clear. Otherwise, you know, there's no point in writing a, a 3000 word article and then say, we don't have any message. So what editors look for is something new, something novel or something original. And I, I, I can tell you, it's not something like, which is like path breaking research all in surgery you can do. Uh, that's more, you know, uh, goes for the basic sciences research where their articles get published in nature and other such journals. But we are basically looking at things which add a little more value to the existing knowledge on that subject. But whatever you must, you say, you must have significant scientific value. You know, it's not just enough to say that uh, our results are a little improved better than the reported results or that's not good enough to say. And it must add to the existing knowledge. I'll give you an example from this is our recent publication. I'll give you an example from my recent publication because that's what I know the details about. So it's not to you know put my own uh, publication before you, but just to discuss how we have done this. This was a study where we looked at outcomes after OAGB. And it, this study also included endoscopy at one year. And when we compiled the result, we did find you know that endoscopy, we had a high rate of marginal ulcers. Now we could have, and it was not a huge number, it was I think about 68 cases. Now if you look at literature, it would be like people have reported hundreds and thousands of cases. But our message, we found a different thing. We found a higher rate of marginal research, which was not really reported from other studies because nobody did a surveillance endoscopy. So we sort of made that our primary, you know, uh, message for the article. Had we not, had we just said, okay, outcomes after OAGB in Indian population or something, you know, study of 68 cases, nobody would have looked at it. But once you have a message, which is makes a global impact, everybody sort of sits up and says, oh yeah, this study does very clearly say there are higher marginal losses. So, so that's what we need to say. Uh, now, so what I mean to say is a research question needs to have a good single primary objective. You can have one or two more objectives, but it's better to have a single primary objective. If you're designing a study, the study is powered based on primary outcome. For example, I'll tell you, suppose you want to study the impact of double J stents in renal transplantation on urinary leaks. Now, obviously you need to have leak as your primary outcome, not the urinary tract infection, which will also happen, which is also, but that can be a secondary outcome. And you're, if you want to control, uh, compare this with a non-stented group, you have to base your sample size calculation on this primary outcome of a urinary leak. And secondary questions objectives are less important and they are not powered. So uh, your primary outcome should be very clear with, from, uh, to you what you are going to study and answer. So does your research answer the research question you raise? No. So we are not going to talk about designing a study. Here we're going to talk about you've already done the research. So how does it answer the research question you raise? So when you describe the research, can your results support a conclusion with a greater global impact? So this is a study 
uh, which we again uh, recently published. This was an idea because this is again a retrospective analysis, uh, and we were uh, very worried by what is happening to our patients with liver cirrhosis. We are finding five percent rate of cirrhosis in our bariatric surgery population, and we want to know exactly. As Dr. Raman said, one offhand you will say, "Okay, everything is good." or everything is bad but if you have to look at it objectively so when we said in the, this is in the introduction this study aims to evaluate the safety and outcome of metabolic and bariatric surgery in severely obese patient with advanced liver fibrosis and we have to our results should say could answer this question whether it's safe and what are the uh, outcome so in conclusion we say metabolic surgery may be safely performed in well optimized cirrhotic patients or patient with advanced fibrosis and has a potential to ameliorate nephrol related cirrhosis in subset of patients so we have actually answered our question so unless you do that you may write anything and you just come out with some you know vague conclusion it could be a negative conclusion you could have said okay metabolic surgery is not safe that's also good enough but one should have a clear cut answer to what you are saying this is a mistake we made recently again from a personal example we decided we'll study the why the outcomes in our own population but we analyzed the data we collected collected everything from our you know database but a sample size of 200 odd cases is not good enough for an article on rygb outcomes and there are several articles thousands of patients no journal no good journal will even have a look at it and although we may personally benefit by knowing our own outcomes as dr raman said it was difficult to write a publishable article which will add to any substantial knowledge uh, maybe it will get set in local journal where indian data may matter but i think we made the mistake of not defining the purpose or the research question before you know starting this uh, analysis so this is what i am saying you know so you must have what you want to say a one clear question before you start your study this is the thing i was talking about these are the things which are talked about and i will not again go into detail as these will be covered in the subsequent lectures these are the general guidelines uh, of how to formulate a research question uh, that to talk about population of interest pcot format intervention uh, if can intervention c for a con comparator or a control group or uh, outcomes which need to be evaluated and t is the time duration so if you look at this topic one can have a simple question like so can surgery cure diabetes or you can have a more structured question can intensive medical therapy plus bariatric surgery that is these are the two groups okay so comparator group and the intervention reduce hba1c which is the uh, outcome after 12 months which is the time duration obese patient which is the population uh, obese patient with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes that is a defined population compared to intensive medical therapy alone so intensive medical therapy is the comparator so if you go back again if you see look at this question it certainly looks better than the question the simple question at surgery cure diabetes so so we need to have this sort of clarity in our mind when we start collecting data or start reporting data and if you want your article to be published look at this again so again bariatric surgery this is a paper published very often quoted very popular paper in bariatric surgical circles published in nejm obviously very high quality journal bariatric surgery versus intensive medical therapy so intervention versus comparative group in obese patients with diabetes this is a target this is a population to be studied now if you look at uh, case report uh, now most there are you know most of the journals are flooded with case reports they are most difficult to get published in good journals and uh, uh, you know although it's easier to write but most uh, surgical journals have stopped taking a case report but still it's a good way to start and as dr anil had stressed what is the novelty of a case you want to study uh it could be a novel technique for example this look at this paper transperitoneal transmesocolic approach for laparoscopic excision of extra adrenal pheochromocytoma i mean if you look do a let search is obviously very little to uh, you'll find so this is obviously a novel technique a rare pathology a rare complication a phrenic nerve palsy uh, in rare complication of indwelling subclavian catheter so when we wrote it we didn't know actually and we did a let search it was really rare so so it is it is you have to have a unique thing to write about so what we think as novel uh, may not be as unique once you do a lit search for example if you, people sometimes come across a foreign body and this thing is very interesting to write yes it can be so if you take this example of a laparoscopic removal and intra abdominal foreign body let's do a lit search 
put foreign body and laparoscopic number was just that, you have 637 results. And you put foreign body and laparoscopic word, it gives more than 1,000 you know, results. So obviously, this is not rare. But some of us would like to think that it's rare and would like to write it. And then we send it for publication. It's rejected by most journals. But don't get disheartened. I would still say we do come across in our career, long career, from time to time, interesting cases. And my suggestion to you is anytime you come across interesting, you do a quick med for med research. Recently, we had a case of a breast uh, aspergillomine in the ward, bilateral. And uh, though it's not my interest area, just ask the resident, have you seen, have you done a Google search or a PubMed search? They said, no. Go, go and do a Google search. And they, not only did it help in finding it's a rare thing, the bilateral breast aspergillomine, they also read about the treatment and they came out with the home, how long the antifungal treatment should be continued. And obviously asked him, please cons you know, go get in touch with the consultant who's looking after this case and write it or, or follow it up. You know. So, so do, do not ignore an interesting case. It, so do a PubMed search. If it's rare, uh, do go, you know, go about writing it. Be sure about this novelty. Find a journal first which accepts the case reports. But make sure that you have all the imaging because without imaging, a case report is useless. Specimen pictures, histopathology pictures are applicable. You cannot be re reporting on hemangio of erysatoma of renal pelvis without having histopathological picture. And I think the most important aspect of case report is that you should teach uh, comprehensively about that particular case uh, with respect to literature. That means you should have done, suppose there are 15 case reports published in that uh, particular rarity, you should have actually read all those 15 articles, probably make a table of all those articles based on clinical presentation, treatment, outcome. That would add much more value to a case report. Uh, I've seen case reports which are very nice, but when it comes to discussion, the author has not done and not put in the hard work it requires. So you need to take out all those articles. If you say thing is rare, obviously it can't be 200 articles. It could be just 10, 15, 20. Take them out. Do a good you know, analysis, make a table, or, and, and see what is different in those, unless you discuss the differences of the management, the presentation especially. So if there are 20 cases of the same you know, rarity, how do they present commonly? So this is an important part which a lot of uh, uh, researchers or the writers neglect uh, while writing a case report. So this is a good quote I found somewhere which uh, from one of the physicists of the 20th century. The measure of greatness in a scientific idea is the extent to which it stimulates thought and opens up new lines of research. Because when you read up an article, it should stimulate you. It should stimulate you. Uh, it should give you a good you know, idea of what is existing, what needs to be done in future, and it should enhance your knowledge. Uh, you should feel good after reading an article, it's not be seen as a wastage of time. So next I'll come to the what I what I personally consider is more important than probably a research question because uh, uh, this is what a lot of people uh, make shortcuts is a literature review, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, the literature review is very essential, a thorough literature review. Not going through the steps, not you have to go through the full articles. There's no shortcuts to that. What it teaches us is what is already known, and then what is the gap in evidence. And what are the limitations of previous studies? I'll show you an example. Uh, so this, this example, look at this example. This is an introduction from one of our published papers. Just see how it's very concise. It's probably one and a half paragraphs, or maybe when you put it in this thing. So what is known? So morbidly obese patients have an increased prevalence of reflux symptoms with different esophagitis. Okay. Uh, so this is what is known. And we give references to each year. What is the gap? Gap is we do not know this paucity of prospective studies which have analyzed the problem of GERD of the sleep gastrectomy as a primary endpoint. There are a lot of you know, case series and a lot of articles which will casually say, okay, GERD increases or GERD decreases. But primary endpoint, there are very few studies. And why do we care? We, we care because sleep gastrectomy has its own, is a very good operation, good weight loss, good metabolic effects. And we do not want to, you know, just on the basis of not knowing something. Uh, we either criticize it unknowingly or or praise it unknowingly, and so, and how do we want to fill this gap? Is to uh, you know to do a study, precise study with GERD as outcome using some investigation. So uh, literature review helps us in exactly defining what is known, 
what is the knowledge gap and editors or journalists want to know this is the introduction uh, where you uh, reflect what whether you have seen the literature properly or not but mind you this is uh, you should not really uh, start your introduction and i am sure dr anil will talk about it later introduction should not be very big it should be very clearly divided into what is known and knowledge gap and that can be done only if you have done a good review of literature another example this was an excellent you know protocol which i came across uh, beautifully written randomized control trial and that's why i kept it as a you know this thing for a teaching purpose so look at this now had the authors not done a good search they would not have found that although there is a existing randomized trial the comparative group was saline irrigation uh, which was probably not a good thing so they said although this trial is on promising results the study is limited by its comparative arm of saline irrigation a more rational approach would have been a head to head comparison of intravesical gemcitabine and other with other chemotherapeutic agents so this is the limitation of the previous study i was talking about so if you do a good literature search you know what is uh, what mistakes other studies have made and we want to correct that in your current study and so based on this they could say till date no randomized trial is available comparing this chemotherapy with this chemotherapy and that's how this study becomes unique so when they write it again this will clearly show it's a unique thing original work has something to say and again dr bandarkar has a talk on this how to do a literature review uh, it's an important part and then there are various tools i will not go through that there are youtube videos and i'm sure dr bandarkar will cover all that so before uh, sandeep i think uh, uh, we have lost you pushpendu uh, are you able to hear him Uh, we aren't. We aren't able to hear him. No. So I think, I think there's a break in the connection. So as he restores his internet, we can probably take <coughs> questions in the meanwhile. And uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Kritika, you can get it checked about his internet connectivity. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sharma, there is a there is a question on. I am willing to write a paper on breast sepsis, converting into carcinoma breast. So please guide me how to proceed. I think uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep Agarwal was discussing this that if you read it on literature, that how many breast sepsises are ultimately are found to be malignant, you will know how rare or how common it is, and then then you can evaluate your own. Sandeep, Hello, are you? Can you take, yeah, can you see me now? Sorry about that. Uh, okay so where do you were we uh, could you get me here uh no uh, yeah you were there on a literature review yes yeah. no uh, so were we uh, had we gone through this slide could you hear me there yeah, yes yes, yes. Gone through the <coughs> okay so uh, as i said dr bandarkar will talk on the subsequent lecture about how to do a good literature review so what my suggestion is while you are conceptualizing a research question or just before that or just after that you should do a thorough review of literature there are no shortcuts to it take out at least five good articles related to your idea proposed research but don't limit no. yourself to just review articles one of the common things i have found with my junior colleagues is they take out one research article go through it and just want to write a proposal read word by word highlight the important points make notes read the discussion section most carefully that's the where you find the problems of those studies which have been already been done look at the cross references then take out another five articles and i make your folder right in the beginning so this is how i'll advise you this is a chapter i'm writing or let's say we're writing on a article on uh, marginal ulcers we take out whatever articles just about a few more than 10 articles we read them through it sometimes we can share between our colleagues but if you i would suggest do it yourself if you are the primary writer of the manuscript it's a hard work uh, one article may take about half an hour to one hour but if you uh, become uh, used to write reading good articles you know what to skip and what to read but i would in initial stage advise you to re read word by word make notes of what is important from these articles because it's very difficult to remember which article said what make notes 
After you've done this, apply for an ethical clearance early. As we said, any study, retrospective or prospective, observational or interventional, can start only after an ethical clearance. I will not go into details of ethical clearance, ethical issues here, and will be covered subsequently. The next step before you write the article is to choose a journal. Some people choose a journal after the article, looking at the quality of the article, that's fair. But I think the beginning is good to choose your journal wherever you want to write or publish it. You don't want to write an article uh, and then you have to do a lot of hard work readjusting the reference styles, the reference uh, you know, quote, how do you quote the reference in the article, whether it's a superscript or in the brackets. And that becomes a lot of tedious you know, work, although there are softwares to help in that. But I would say, look at the journal. So what do you look at? Look at their article processing time. Suppose you are a postgraduate who have finished a thesis, you want a quick publication, uh, may not be a very high impact journal because you want a job or a senior agency, go for a journal which has a shorter article processing time. Look at the type of articles, look at the impact factor. If you are not, you know, if you want, if you think your article is of good quality, you want in a higher impact journal, look at that. Another important is whether open access or not, or hybrid journal. But remember, all open access journals charge a fee unless your institution has subscribed to that portal. Whether the review is blinded or not, it matter in, in some cases. Once you have decided, uh, read about the about us section of the for the scope of the journals and the instructions to the author section carefully. Don't ignore it, okay? Because once you have decided, read thoroughly. Read some articles or several articles of the journal that gives you an idea, uh, you know, how the, what is the journal expecting, what sort of articles are getting accepted. There are certain tools available like Journal Finder or Springer Journal Suggester, but I think with experience you come to know which journal is good for you. For example, this, I'm, I'll go from, because I'm a bariatric surgeon, I'll give you an example. This is one of the top-notch journals ran, ranked seventh in all the surgical journals. So, unless an article on uh, sort of uh, psychological something after obesity with no surgical intervention. Now, this journal clearly says we see publications of peer-reviewed manuscript of highest quality with objective data regarding techniques for the treatment of severe obesity. Article dom document the effect of surgically induced weight loss on obesity. So, if you have an article which is not really dealing with bariatric surgery or some sort of intervention, they will not take your article. You, it will be a waste of time. You will format it according to the journal, send it, and they will reject it straight away at the editorial level. But you have a different journal, like clinical obesity. So, so now you look at its scope, key areas of interest are. So it is a much broader uh, area for obesity. People, physicians who are dealing in obesity, the psychologists, the paramedics, the, all that, you know, they can send their articles here. So you need to know uh, which journal to send. This is our own journal, JMAS. So if you want, so it shows you what are the types of articles it will accept. Leading articles, reviews, original articles, and it will give you some detail of what it sort of is expecting. Unusual cases, how I do it differently, troubleshooting. So each journal gives you, and it's extremely important to have a look at what are the types of manuscripts they are going to take. Now, if you want to, I mean, so this is an obesity surgery journal, which is the second, you know, highest ranked journal in obesity surgery. And I think one of the most attractive po points about this journal is their time to for submission. So submission to first decision is just one month, which is extremely, extremely fast going by publishing standards. And it still has a good impact factor of 3.4. So, so you so you have to look at several factors when you are looking at uh, choosing a journal. And there are many others. But these are the few more important things which you are looking at. But one thing I must sort of caution you is beware of predatory journals. There are a number of journals. Every day you get emails uh, soliciting articles uh, which have, if you publish, have no value. They are actually counterproductive because if you go for an academic job and if you code, if you put in your CV a journal uh, article which has been published in a predatory journal, it's a negative, big, big negative for you. They charge exorbitant publication fees. They do not provide any services associated with legitimate journals, and they use false impact factors. And I'm all of I'm sure all of you have seen these emails. So when it comes to actual writing now, I would say decide on authorship. There are multiple authors. It will avoid conflict later on, especially the order of authorship. I have burned my fingers myself. Uh, sometimes the person who's done the research and the person who's writing it may be different. And they both qualified to be actually the first author because they have put in equal amount of hard work. So it's 
probably at the out, outset is better to define who is going to be the first author and the second author. You might change depending on the person is not put enough work. This is this is all I always tell my residents or colleagues. If you've not if you're if not put in good work, you will cannot be among the first few authors. And there are guidelines on authorship about clear cut criteria for authorship, uh, which uh, are useful to go through. And and one thing you must remember: uh, this is recently as I came across some requests like that. A change of order of authors or authorship after manuscript is accepted is not usually a seen in good light. It's not the done thing. And this is a quote from Sword. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, that only in exceptional circumstances will the editor consider the addition, deletion, or rearrangement of authors after the manuscript has been accepted. So while the author editor considers the request, the publication of the manuscripts will be suspended. So it's a big nuisance to you know change author. It's not a good thing to do. Uh, and uh, authorship should be limited to those who have made a significant contribution uh, to the concept, design, execution, or interpretation of the reported study. And there are various, you know websites you can go through to get this. And how to now actually write an article, this Imrat format is what is uh, given in all the journals. And I don't think anything goes beyond this. There's anything different. And I'm sure Dr. Anish Sharma is going to go in detail when he talks about the principles of writing. But broadly, it talks about why the research, what and how we have done it, what was found. And the discussion is it answers the research question. Your discussion should clearly answer the question you raised in introduction. And I, I will be surprised how many people fail to do so. They just repeat the introduction. They repeat the results in discussion. They are going to lateral thing describing obesity epidemiology and all that. So, so and describing a particular operative technique. And so the discussion is basically answering the research question and discussing it with respect to the other studies which are reported on this. So just to summarize my you know, talk, a good scientific writing, as I said initially, is like creating a story. It may have a structure format, but still it's, it's a story. So you have to create a logical flow from one idea to the next. Demands clarity and precision, as Dr. Anil said uh, in short. Uh, reduce wordiness. So whenever I get a manuscript from my colleague to check and go through, I decrease the number of words by at least 20%, 10 to 20%, because there's so much of unnecessary words being used to describe a thing which can be described in 10 words it'll be somebody will use and, and it all comes with experience i can i can tell you even if once i have gone through that somebody senior looks at it he may further reduce it this comes with experience so there's no you know nothing to feel bad about if some senior person is reducing the number of words or correcting your sentences so but reduce wordiness because that's very that's at a premium the number of words especially in a case report be concise Avoid long sentences. You can get lost. You know, just uh, put simple, short sentences. Put a full stop, start another sentence. No, there's no need to put semicolon, colon, and brackets, and uh, you know, hyphen, and keep going on till the cows come home. So we can't, you know, and it sort of creates so much of confusion. Impressions and guesswork should be avoided. I'll tell you one example. So one of the recent paper I reviewed, the the, the author said uh, the the Definitions of weight regain after bariatric surgery remain obscure. Now, that's obviously an incorrect statement. There are very precise definitions. There may be multiple definitions, but they're definitely not obscure. So they don't just say anything, you know, just because you you just in a you just sort of heard it in your mind. You, these are just uh, impressions. They, they're not backed by literature. And any guesswork should be avoided in a scientific writing. Any important statement that is not the direct result of a study should have a reference. Remember that. Don't make any reference. Okay, uh, so uh, let's say uh, a laparoscopic gastric banding is the most popular revisional bariatric surgical procedure. Now, you, if you don't back it by a reference, you should not put that statement. Okay, so any important statement, use a reference. Uh, uh, follow the instruction to the author strictly by word. Go There are checklists. Go by that. But at the end of it, what is important is to be honest. Honest to yourself, honest to your colleagues, honest to what you write. And that would take you further in scientific writing. Thank you so much. Happy writing. And I hope this course uh, gives you the much needed impetus and sort of a broad outline of how to start writing. Thank you so much for your patient design. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. So I think uh, uh, this was a very informative talk, giving an overview of uh, right from research question to publication. 
and we are going to cover different aspects of this uh, presentation in, uh, in different topics so we are we have a long list of questions but probably we'll take them at the end so that we make up some time uh, dr sandeep kumar sir would you like to uh, uh, have any observation before we move on you will have to unmute yourself brilliant as usual as expected from sandeep i think he's covered all aspects <clears throat> Since we are getting late, and I must leave at around quarter past six, so I think um, um, I would let next call, uh, okay. talk by Dr. Deep Raj. So, yeah, friends. So, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Deep Raj Bhandarkar. I am sure everybody in India knows him well. Uh, Dr. Deep Raj Bhandarkar is the founder editor of JMAS. who single handedly brought it up to a level there where it has the the best impact factor among the surgical journals in india and at the moment he is the chief editorial advisor of jmas after handing over the reins to our uh, new editorial team so deepraj uh, welcome back on jmas activity and the topic he is going to talk about is the literature search the beginning uh thank you uh, raman i think uh, it was a very uh, interesting presentation by uh, sandeep uh, am i well audible yes 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 okay thank you uh, so i'm going to take this one step further and what we're going to look at is uh, i'm actually going to get my headphones off so what we're going to look at here is the first step when one decides to write an article and that starts with naturally the first step is an idea for a research for a topic or for as somebody said uh, you see an interesting uh, pathology and you want to write this up as a case report so the first thing naturally is the idea or the desire to write the next step after that is a thorough literature search and dr sandeep has touched upon it slightly but we will take this further and look at it in uh, greater detail i have no disclosures for this talk and when we talk about a uh, literature review before writing an article this is the quote that always comes to mind from abraham lincoln what he said was if i had 6 hours to chop down a tree i would spend first 4 hours sharpening the axe and it is very pertinent when it comes to the literature search and the time spent in researching a topic should be almost half of that if not more of what one would actually spend in writing and rewriting that uh, article because unless you have done a thorough literature search and understood the topic well enough it is not possible for you to write a good article so we will touch upon these aspects of literature search what exactly is it why is it necessary how does one do it so we'll actually see some practical tips on how does one uh, uh, do the literature search what are the sources to look up for this and most importantly how does one obtain the reprints or the full text articles because it's not adequate to just read the abstract or sometimes uh, extended abstract but one needs to have access to the reprints or full text pdf file to be able to draw a meaningful conclusion from reading these uh, papers so literature search is essentially the search for and reading of all published research on a given problem or a question so as we said we start first with the question or the research question and then embark on this uh, next uh, step next we come to why is it important to uh, search the literature fundamentally we must understand that anything that we write today has probably already been written about or has already been touched upon in the literature somewhere so it is important not to duplicate the research some of the cases some of the aspects that you feel may be very interesting if there is enough literature on it already in the surgical sciences there is little chance that it will get published and that's why it's probably not worth spending time and effort on uh, writing that paper up in the first place 
sciences. It also also gives you an overview of what has already been studied and published. You may always have a slightly different take or a slightly different research question in mind, but if you start by assimilating what is already said, it's easier to formulate that question in a way that it can then stand a better chance of getting published as a paper. In any paper, one of the important sections in the discussion part of a paper is actually comparing and contrasting your results with what has been said or what has been already published. And that's why having a good grasp of the literature of the previously written papers is important so that you can compare and contrast your findings, your data, your analysis with what is there in the literature. So how does one do a literature search? Now let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. So first, identify the topic and the preliminary research question. So this is an hypothetical question and we will work with that and see how does one do a literature search based on say this topic. So the question that we are posing for ourselves is does the timing of laparoscopic cholecystectomy during acute cholecystitis influence the rate of complications? Now, that first topic may be too broad a topic to form a sensible topic for a paper. Complications is a broad word. Do we really mean does it affect the or influence the rate of bile duct injury? That may be more pertinent and that may be easier to search. So how does one effect use the PubMed? What are the search strategies that we use? What are the filters that we use? And how does one get full text reprint? We are not going to go into the details of the PubMed. PubMed, the PubMed is a vast resource and it's far easier to actually go to the PubMed site and go through their question answer page uh, to see what are the strategies and getting the best out of it. Also, as Sandeep showed in one of the slides, there are several videos on YouTube which you can access, which tell you in detail what strategies to use when uh, accessing PubMed and looking for literature. So let us take an example of this topic and this laparoscopic cholecystectomy, acute cholecystitis and complications in the PubMed uh, uh, box. If you look at the number there, this has thrown up nearly 1300 papers. Now that is a vast number of papers. It's not physically possible to access those papers or to go through them uh, in a practical way. So let us actually narrow this down to laparoscopic cholecystectomy and bile duct injury. The number immediately comes down to 210. Now, at the first instance, you may not want to read each and every one, one of these articles, but what you would do as a preliminary introduction to that topic, you would want about anywhere between 10 to 20 good quality papers. As Sandeep emphasized, it's not important only to read the review articles, but if there have been uh, original articles reporting series of bile duct injuries in the setting of acute cholecystitis and laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you must read at least a few of them to give you a feel for what the current knowledge or current body of knowledge of literature on this subject is. So let us now narrow this down. If we put this in parenthesis, so if we say laparoscopic cholecystectomy, acute cholecystitis and bile duct injury in parenthesis, this tells the PubMed or the uh, search engine that you're looking specifically for articles which contain all these three phases. And this, as you can see, narrows down the search to about 129. Again, too big a number to do your primary search on. Now, if you go to the left side and click on this filter, which says review, it will bring up only 18 articles. So that is probably a good place to start initially. But as I said, at some stage, once you have enough knowledge, once you start reading these review articles, each of those review articles would have put certain tapes which you can go and track and access and look through. So that is the 
strategy that one uses for searching and researching the literature. Now, most important is you need access to something that can be downloaded and read easily. So if you again activate this filter which says free full text, it gives you two articles which are free for you to download. So these are the open access articles. So this, to my mind, would make a good starting point for a research like this when you just get a feel for it. By no means this is adequate or this is extensive, but this would start a good reading for you. Each of these review articles would probably be about 10 to 12 pages and would be comparatively exhaustive that they do give you a feel for the subject as to what has already been said or what is uh, being done already. The next step is to go to Google. It is amazing how many articles which sometimes do not show up on the first page or first two pages of a PubMed search come up very easily on Google. There are certain PDF engines, ResearchGate, I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and actually getting some of these reprints by requesting the authors directly for it. So let us look at Google. Now, if you simply put this laparoscopic cholecystectomy and acute cholecystitis and bile duct injury in Google, you will come up with several. I mean, it, it says that it shows you something like 1,20,000 uh, uh, searches. I mean, that's not a practical number by any chance. But it tells you what are the, if you go to the setting and tools, and if you say articles or searches in the last, say, five years, it will immediately narrow them down to what has been written recently about this topic. In all likelihood, that paper or that review would have researched or would have taken into account what was written prior to that. So that way you can get some more articles that you want to uh, look for. So this is a filter. You say past year or there is a custom range. You can say five years and it easily brings up the uh, uh, articles on the subject. There are some specialized PDF search engines. Now, these articles can be scattered anywhere on the net. They need not only be on the journal website. They could be on the author's website. They could be in several other places. And if you use one of these PDF search engines, so just put in PDF finder in Google and you'll come up with several of these PDF search engines which give you access to the full text articles for you to download and read. So this will allow you to look for those articles. So this is one example, PDF search engine.org. You just need to put in the, so here you do not put in the keywords. You need to be able to put in the title of the paper because that is how this will search. It will not search only by, so this is not like Google that it will search by the keywords that you put in. You need to copy paste the title of the article into this and if there is a PDF or a free to download PDF available somewhere, this would find it for you and you will be able to then download and look for it. ResearchGate is a platform where those, who, those surgeons or those clinicians who are active academically and publish, they put up their uh, articles or they put up the reprints of the article or at least the title and abstract of the article on this website. Now, for example, this is Dr. Anil Sharma's uh, research page. So the address is researchgate.net. And if you open it and if you put the name of the author that you're looking for in this search engine, you will come up with his article. So this is an old page. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharma at that time had 117 uh, research articles out of which 106 were uh, uh, articles. There was one book and several book chapters. So you should be able to go down this list and look for the articles that you were looking for. On ResearchGate, there is a link to say full text available for download. So some of the articles which Dr. Sharma would have uh, uploaded in its full text format would be easily available for download just with a click button. If not, you can always request the author to send you the full text. So there'll be a link if the full text is not available, there'll be a button which said request full text. So if you click on that, 
and email will get sent to Dr. Sharma automatically, suggesting or indicating that such and such person is interested in accessing uh, an article that he has written. And more of, uh, often than not, the authors who put up these articles, those who are academic, would be happy to share their uh, research with you. So that's the button that you would click on, request full text, and uh, you would get articles. Sometimes all these methods do not easily work, and you have to rely on getting the reprints of an article directly from the author who has written it. So how does one go about it? Now again, going back to our example of PubMed, the authors or the first authors or the senior authors email so that you can write a polite email to them requesting uh, 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 requesting that article for you. So this was a patient that we were managing that this lady had a Cushing's adenoma during pregnancy. And the question was, do we, what should be the ideal strategy for this? Do we perform an adrenalectomy during the second trimester? Do we wait? So this was the article that after searching a lot, I came through that this was a case report with review of literature. And the PubMed had only the abstract. There was no easy way of my getting access to this particular uh, European uh, gynecology journey. So today PubMed has done a peculiar thing that they hide the author information under this tab. Previously, the author's institution, the email, etc. used to be displayed. But today, for some reason, for the last two years, they've started hiding it. But if you click on it, you get the author's email here. So what I did was I simply wrote a polite email to this author explaining why I needed access to his uh, paper. That my endocrinologist colleague is currently looking after a patient with Cushing syndrome detected during the second trimester. And the patient is being considered for an adrenalectomy. That therefore, I would like to have access to your paper to read about what is the thought process uh, on this currently in the in the literature because this is an uncommon uh, scenario. And trust me, when you send a request such as this to an author who has published something, it's not uncommon or it's natural for the author to feel flattered. And most of them would within 24 to 48 hours oblige you by sending you uh, a PDF rip, uh, reprint of the uh, paper. So this is one way of very easily getting a reprint from the author himself. Sometimes the author information is not very easy to find. This very old paper, 1996, written by uh, Michael Eady and uh, Barry Solke. At the time, both of them used to work at Mount Sinai. And this actually is a landmark paper in the literature on paraesophageal hernia. What they postulated was excision of the sac during a laparoscopic paraesophageal hernia repair is essential to prevent a recurrence. So this was the first time that this thought was put forward and they had a series of cases to support that uh, idea. But again, old issue of surgical endoscopy, not easy to find, not easy to get access to this. If you click on author information, none of the author's uh, email appears there. Maybe in 96, it was not customary for them to uh, put the email in the author information. So this is where the detective inside you should come forth. And you can do a little bit of digging around to find at least one of the author's uh, email. So we know that from this paper that this paper was published from Mount Sinai Medical Center. So we can go to the, and this is true, and I've done this several times, particularly the American hospitals have easy access to the uh, doctors, the clinicians' email on their website. The Europeans are not so particular about it. Obviously, this usually is an email which is a professional or a hospital email, and it's hardly ever a personal email. So let's look at the doctors on this Mount Sinai hospital website. And we can see that Michael E.D. is here. Barry Solke is also here. So if you click on Michael E.D., it will take you to his page, which gives his brief biodata. And this is his hospital's email, michael.ed at mountsinai.org. 
So you can easily capture this from this point and then write an email to him saying that you require uh, or you request him to send a reprint of his article. And he most often, as I said, the authors would be more than happy to share it with you. I'm going to briefly talk about this. I just got one slide. Dr. Sandeep emphasized on this. Getting lots of reprints and keeping them in a folder is never enough. You actually have to read them and synthesize or assimilate them. And there are various ways of doing them. What I find easiest to do is to read from the first word to the last word each paper. I usually use, uh, read them on a, on, a, on a computer in a PDF format. I also highlight in yellow or in green the text which I feel I may want to uh, refer to when I'm writing an article. But at the same time, I find it useful to have a Word document open in, uh, parallelly side by side and the useful. So I would start by writing the title of the paper on top on a page, the authors and the exact citation. And some of the ideas from that paper, which I feel are going to be useful for me to quote or refer to in my paper, I would jot them down on that page. Next article, a new page and the same thing again. So if you read say 30, 40, 50 articles for a topic, you would have a big fat file, a Word document of about 40 or 50 or even more pages which will easily give you at a glance all the ideas that you need to refer to when writing the paper. Mind you, it's never a good idea to simply copy paste sentences or ideas from any paper into your uh, article, even by referencing them. That is just not done. That's plain and simple plagiarism. So one needs to be extremely careful in avoiding that. It always needs to be paraphrased or better still, you need to the idea and express it in your word. But this method of reading the articles and summarizing them then gives you the possibility that you then have to go only through that one document file rather than going back and forth to multiple PDFs looking for ideas which you felt were important and that you wanted to quote in your paper. So this is what I find useful. There are now several uh, sort of app or softwares for doing this. I simply like to use this system because I have used this for years and it works well for me. These are some of the uh, resources I have put down on this uh, last slide. That these are resources about how to intelligently search the literature. Uh, so the first one is actually this is an excellent series. So if you go to the Singapore Medical Journal, this was I think about 2002 or 2003, they had carried a series of about 10 or 12 articles on medical writing. So one of them was on literature search. So this is the URL for that. But if you go to that here, Singapore Medical Journal, and these are all uh, uh, full text free articles for you to download. It's an excellent series of 10 to 12 articles on how to write a paper. The second one is from the NLM website, uh, which is the PubMed uh, body in the guns. And they have some, uh, tutorials there which uh, tell you how to use the PubMed uh, sensibly. And the rest of them are certain resources which you will find uh, useful. So thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your uh, listening in. Thank you, thank you, Deepraj. I think I think that was very elaborate and uh, self-explanatory. I'm sure people would find it very useful when they're doing a search because you know search is such an important component of uh, literature search, and you one feels handicapped because uh, one may not know the exact way to do it. And uh, I think you're giving great tips to to each one of us. Uh, I think what we can do, Deepraj, if you are agreeable, that we can continue with the talks and then because there are many questions which are overlapping between different speakers. No, no, absolutely. Let's go ahead with the talks. So uh, I think the, 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 the hardcore thing starts now. Uh, how to write the principles by Dr. Anil Sharma again. Uh, Dr. Sharma, 
uh, are you ready with your presentation yes uh, thank you raman let me just uh, share my screen first of all yeah and then get to my presentation which is this one right okay so so can you see the slide yes right so okay well thank you thank you deep raj and sandeep that that were great contributions uh, you know we we've been all contributing together for this course for for a long time now and we we hope to be continuing this in times to come so my job here is to to speak on uh, the principles of how to write so the great man himself said if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it well enough so the point here is to put your message across simply and concisely and lucidly so uh, when you want to go for a long drive you will not uh, just jump into your car and start driving you will have a road map you will make a plan and then start to drive so we guys here uh, the the subcontinent specifically there is a term that is that is known as jugad and we are very adept at it it's a way of innovating of of trying to improvise to get work done and you you have several examples of this you know in our day to day life across our cities and towns and villages but in medical writing unfortunately uh, you know uh, we are very formal there is a format in place and this needs to be followed all the time and uh, uh, we have talked about this this format which is the the imrad format and this means that as we know introduction the methods the results and finally discussion but if you look at the entire structure of an article this is what it constitutes the the title the abstract the keywords the imrad and finally conclusion and references this is one complete article for you so for original articles this is how things normally play out okay there there are no sort of uh, no very uh, hard and fast rules but then normally this is how things play out the introduction normally two paragraphs five paragraphs of methods normally seven paragraphs of results and six paragraphs of discussion so there are 20 units of thought to prepare for an article okay now why i am saying this is that you have to to in fact consider your article to be 20 units of thought and these 20 units of thought need to be addressed one unit at a time so so, so let's try and, and do that now the first two units of thought in the introduction which is why did we start okay that is your segment on the introduction so like sandeep said you know some time ago the first paragraph is what is the current knowledge on the subject and like you know deep raj has been saying uh, uh, prof sandeep kumar said prof sandeep agarwal said you know raman also mentioned till you have read and you know what is the current knowledge you can't start obviously 
So your first paragraph just talks about what is the current knowledge on the subject that you are dealing with. The second paragraph derives from the first paragraph. The second paragraph picks up something that that may be in fact considered to, to, to be a lacuna, that, that may be something that has not been addressed properly, maybe something that, that needs a little clarification from what is known already. And that is why you did your study. So the last sentence of the second paragraph normally would appear like this. The aim of the study was with so-and-so, or we report so-and-so, we repute so-and-so. Two paragraphs of introduction. Now, the second segment, the, the next uh, uh, segment is that on the methods. When we talk about methods, please remember we are, we are just talking about what did we do. The story of what the authors did, which should appear in a logical framework of time. So we, we first sought approval from the ethics board. We, we selected our patients, we made two groups, we did this particular intervention, and then these are the things we had measured. Okay, so, so a logical framework of time, just like a story. And please be clear about your primary endpoint and secondary endpoints. The uh, the, the primary endpoint is the main reason of doing your study. What was the main thing that, that you had measured in the study? And please note that for one study, you must have one primary endpoint or perhaps two at the most. Okay, never more than that. The main point of, of your study becomes your primary endpoint. And then you can have perhaps three or four secondary endpoints as well that, that you in fact looked at and measured in your study. So the next five units of thought, these are the five paragraphs that, that should appear in your method section. The study design, you know, what sort of a study is this? Retrospective, prospective, retro pro, the patients, Next paragraph, how did you select your, your patients? What patients were, were included? What patients were excluded and why? The intervention that, that was performed, what was done? You know, there should uh, be sufficient detail in it so that somebody who is reading knows exactly what you did. The fourth paragraph is the, the outcome measurements. Okay, what did you measure? What, what parameters did you record? When did you record them? Okay, the fourth paragraph, the outcome assessment. And finally, what, what statistics were used? So these are your five paragraphs of the methods, your next five units of thought, and take them one at a time. As you can see, they, they are all very distinct from each other. The next segment, the results. So when we talk about results, we just talk about what did we find, that's it. So the story of the main findings. Now, your main findings should be a blend, a blend of text and figures. And what sorts of figures? You can have graphs, you can have bar diagrams, you can have charts, you can have tables. Okay, make it a mixture. So a blend of text and these figures. And do not, do, do, do not in fact, repeat the information that, that has gone in a table, again, in the text, it's, it's a waste of time. So be concise, like, like we keep saying, and do not interpret your results here. 
Okay, in this segment, you, you just have to state your results and confine yourself there. And the final segment on discussion. So what does it mean? Okay, when we talk about this segment on discussion, it is about, so what does it mean? So your first paragraph normally should, should consist of what you did and what you found. So a concise statement about what was done and what was found in your study in the first paragraph. Then subsequently, you start talking about limitations of your study. You know, be, be upfront when it comes to, 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 to a talking about limitations of your study, because this shows that, that you are a humble chap. Okay, the reviewers like to read papers from humble chaps, and so do the editors. So if, if you can state, you know, right up front about, about limitations of the study, everybody, you know, relaxes a bit. They feel good that, that you have pointed it out yourself. Now, strengths of the study, you know, shouldn't come right up there. Talk, talk very little about the strengths. And particularly, it's about making statements like the first study, you know, when, when somebody reads the, the, first, the first study, for example, as a reviewer or an editor, it starts ringing, you know, alarm bells. So be, be very careful about your, your sort of use of phrases. You, you, you can point out certain strengths in your study, but uh, try and avoid terms like first case and first report and, and stuff like that. Now you found something in your study. How does does this fit in with the other studies that, that that are there in literature already? So compare and contrast study with similar studies in literature. And please remember when when it comes to discussion, you must not just state what you found, but 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 you must also talk about why you found what you found. So I'll talk about pros, cons. Okay, and finally about uh, the implications of your study. So, so you uh, did something, you found something, so what? So, so what do you state now? You know, do, you, do you want there, there should be uh, further research perhaps in, in some branch where, where, where we still don't have all the answers? Should there be some change in, in policy as far as patient management is concerned? Should there be a little change in clinical practice you know, based on what you found? So, so a discuss about the implications of your study. a small segment of of conclusion where you you have to be extremely careful now do not put in something in the conclusion that you have not studied for which you have no data that that you have written about so don't talk about things you have not studied at all in the conclusion and go back write uh, to the introduction segment, the, the second paragraph that, that talks about why you did this study. And, you know, that, that should align with your statements over here. Please remember, right at the end, very important, you know, if you, you, you have done previous bits well, but then falter right at the conclusion and talk about things that you have not even studied or, or recorded or provided data for, it is like a big red flag or for the reviewer, for the editors. So while referencing most commonly Vancouver system of, of, you know, for references works throughout the world, 
Now, people sometimes ask what should be the, the uh, uh, correct order to write. No hard and fast rules again. But normally what, what some authors suggest is perhaps you can do methods and results first, which means what you did and what you found first, followed with the introduction and discussion. And last of all, title and abstract. But that, this is something that can vary. So, so don't worry about this at all. Now, the role of a biostatistician. Now, this is something that I feel very strongly about because though this is a breed that, that instills a lot of fear and distaste in us okay, as surgeons, but let me tell you, this, this is a breed that we need for or surgical writing and publishing. And, and, and you can see over here, you know, why you need them right from the stage of protocol development when, when you are writing up your study protocol to the management of your data to when you are collecting data for your study during that process as well, you, you, will, you will need a biostatistician he can, can keep monitoring what is going on with your study from time to time. And finally, of course, data analysis. There are scripts, of, there, there are parts of the manuscript that, that he can write for you as well about statistics, for example. So if you ask me in one sentence, what is the, the role of a biostatistician? It is to sex things up. The biostatistician makes it more glamorous. The biostatistician makes your, your work more attractive. So well, how to get started? Okay, find one clear message. Please note just one message per, per, per article, you know, is what is required. You don't need too many messages in one article. It defeats your purpose. And write it down as a simple sentence of 10 to 14 words. So where, where do you get a clear message from? A clear message comes from a clear research question. And like uh, Sandeep showed you a while ago, a clear research question stems from the PICO acronym which is, which patients, what, what sort of an intervention, what comparison, and what were the outcomes. So a, a clear message comes from a clear research question. Now you don't want, want to be doing research that is not relevant you don't want to be doing research that is not required. You don't want, want to be doing research that, that is futile, like what uh, you know, I just, just came across a few months ago. This sort, this sort of a research helps nobody. So, so this, this, this is one very clear message that stems from, from, a, from a PICO acronym again. <laughs> Gallbladder removal from the umbilical port leads to a greater incidence of port site hernia. So what were the patients? Patients that, that had gallbladder removal. The umbilical What was the intervention? Laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Do we have comparison? Yes. You know, those patients that, that had gallbladder removal from the epigastric port. What were the outcomes? A, a port site hernia. So a clear message from a clear research question. Okay, one, one more example of a clear message. Trans abdominal sutures to fix meshes in laparoscopic incisional hernia repair leads to more postoperative pain. So patients those having laparoscopic uh, 
ventral incisional hernia repair. The intervention, you know, laparoscopic incisional hernia repair. Comparison, yes, you know, th those patients that, that uh, did not have transabdominal sutures. And what, what were the outcomes? Postoperative pain. So a clear, a clear message from a clear research question. And this is something I will not spend time on because Sandeep has, has talked about this. You know, there are fairly standard guidelines in, in most surgical journals. And you will see that, that most surgical journals would follow these two guidelines. Uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Now, now these wise men sat down together and and formulated a set of guidelines which is being followed universally throughout the world in, a, in different journals. And of course, the COPE guidelines, these are the ones that, that, are, that are talked about in most surgical journals. So most uh, surgical journals would, would in fact require a statement from you that says uh, that, that you had sought and you had approval from your local ethics committee. You know, people will be happy if you can demonstrate to, to, to them your registration of study as a clinical trial and of course follow guidelines. Now just a, a few words about data management just to show you that, that you have to be very careful about what you put in because what comes out depends on what you put in. So be very meticulous about your data entry. Now, uh, a start can be perhaps, you know, look at the most common seven, eight, or 10 operations that you do and uh, start feeding in data in drop down boxes, you know, style. Just just one tool choose from multiple choices. That is the way you, you can build up data of your patients, pre-operative, intra-operative, and, and post-operative as well. It can be stored in any manner, but then when, when it needs uh, to, be, to be sort of analyzed, then uh, the Microsoft Excel worksheet is a pretty uh, a standard form where, where you can can place your your data, and the, and this is some some software that that you can have quite readily that can in fact you know analyze your your data when that is presented to, in the form of a Microsoft Excel worksheet. So so when you do that, you can have you know, bar diagrams and uh, figures and, and charts and, and stuff like that, that makes your, your data that much more attractive and logical. So, well, finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want something you never had, you have to do something you have never done. So, uh, that's about taking the first few baby steps into medical writing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. I think that was, that was very enlightening and uh, comprehensive coverage of our topic to begin with, because uh, this is just the end of the first day. We are going to have many more presentations tomorrow in continuity. And before we take the questions, let me tell you tomorrow we are going to have uh, another talk by Dr. Sharma on how to write the structure. And Dr. Adipraj Bhandarkar is going to cover how to write a case report. And uh, Dr. Anil Sharma will talk about uh, titles, abstracts, tables, and figures. And Dr. Sandeep Agrawal is going to speak on why are articles rejected. And then probably the most important of all, ethics and publication by Dr. Deepraj Bhandarkar. So I think... We have a lot more to come tomorrow. 
and i'm told that dr sandeep kumar wants to leave early dr sandeep do you want to have any observations about today's presentations and then we'll start with questions I think uh, I'll take few questions as we go along, and uh, the questions which have already been answered, like uh, there is a question on what are the criteria to have good publications. I think this is all what we are discussing in a few days. It's too broad a question, and this is what is going to be covered. Uh, a specific question, uh, Dr. Sharma, is it always necessary to start with summary while writing? So do you write an abstract first? or a summary of uh, what or how do you how do you start writing up paper yeah so we we will actually get into the the structure of writing a paper when tomorrow first presentation but uh, what i find useful is like like i had shown in the slide earlier first you know try and get a one clear message for your article out there in your mind and then write it down it should be a a simple basic sentence and then paste it on your board where where you can in fact keep seeing it regularly as you keep writing so one clear message and the the these 20 units of thought that uh, that we had talked about you know some time ago we go through those 20 units of thought tomorrow one by one because like i said you you can't think about uh, the entire article just in one go the entire article has got to be broken down into much smaller units and these smaller units you know they, they these are in fact very well defined units so we will see this uh, the the first presentation, first presentation tomorrow that talks about the structure of how you you start writing a paper yeah i think one point that that has come out pretty well today and i've been finding it very challenging is that the the research question so uh, there are multi centric studies that and uh, when we discuss it with the other other surgeons they are in the process of collecting lot of data collecting lot of data without clarity of what is the research question in their mind and they feel that once you have data you will find what is relevant i think this is a this is a very a negative way of looking at it because there is no purpose or focus in your collection of data while if you had the research question in mind you will collect it based on that research question rather than having a a pile of data which is of no use and it's a waste of effort to <coughs> this part as it is the roman some role of deductive research with in large data analysis now because of these mobile companies and google things so if you have a simpler research question a generic research question that can be a deductive research question but you are absolutely right that for a purposeful short scientific paper as has been alluded by earlier speakers there has to be one good research question one set of data collection one primary endpoint one or two secondary endpoint one good answer and that's your boon in the dhala of or or the ocean of knowledge and that's what correct but there is something nowadays known as deductive research okay uh, deepraj you want to add something uh, yeah so just a uh, couple of points i would like to make here one is uh, somebody is asked whether it's a good idea to write the summary or the uh, abstract now the word summary itself suggests you summarizing what you have already written so although the summary or the abstract appears as the first piece uh, uh, in any article that in fact you have to resist the temptation to write that as the first uh, piece because that all once you have your clear thought process once you have the uh, methodology once you have the results the discussion the abstract has to be written at the end of that uh, whole process one more thing about abstract is once you are writing the abstract be 100% sure that there is no conflict in uh, any numbers or data between the abstract and what has been uh, written in the main paper because that is something that is frowned upon by uh, 
both the reviewers as well as the editor one final thought i would like to give to the people who sometimes feel overwhelmed with the idea of writing a paper or uh, you know starting to write a paper and there just seems to be so much to be done anil will show us tomorrow he's got a beautiful presentation on this i have heard it before on the idea of units of thoughts and what i would suggest to a young writer who's starting on this journey is to not think about the entire paper to start with you just have to say that yes i need to get my materials and methods section written over say 5 days or a week leave that aside and then say yes now i'm just focusing on the result section so at that time when you are writing these units of thought don't let the idea about writing the discussion comparing your data with uh, other people's data Uh, cross your mind because it sometimes becomes too overwhelming to try and uh, cope with it. So the idea is to do so. Essentially, in so many areas of our lives, if we break down the task into smaller tasks, they become more manageable. Yeah. Okay. All right. There is another question. Uh, I am a beginner. One want to start right. Have you taken it there? How and when to submit the article in a best journal? You know. So. if there is a beginner he should should he try a uh, not such a good journal which will accept his paper or uh, he if uh, or he should try the best journal i mean how, how does one prioritize uh, a journal or how does one select a journal basically uh, the person is asking that shall i answer it yeah sure yeah. sir i think uh, the way i have been telling my students is to have it peer reviewed have a guru around you and he will let you know because as a beginner you may be um uh, you may be um uh, you know doing it for a uh, for your boss for somebody and that uh, that somebody may be having uh, big ideas and maybe having maybe very <clears throat> you know uh aspirant of sending it to a bigger journal so beginner doesn't really mean but if it is an article you are a beginner it's your thesis article it's entirely on your behalf uh, you should really go in for a journal which you should which should which is reputed to give you a good review and where you think there will not be just one line rejection so you should as was already said by the person you should carefully sandeep agarwal i think he said it that you should carefully read the instructions to the authors you should first see that it is in the scope of the journal you should have it assessed by some uh, senior who has been publishing that is it worth sending it to a very uh, uh, high profile journal and then you should submit it okay. can i add to that yes sure yeah. so there are two ways you know as i said in my talk uh, if somebody is looking for a quick publication then i think the best thing is to look have a look at the publication time but what dr sandeep kumar said is what is actually the right thing to do if you have enough time on your hand is to send it to a good journal get good reviews to improve your you know paper that really help tremendously you see some of the submissions the reviews sent by as journals like soar they are really good even if they reject your manuscript the you you they yourself see yes we have missed out on a lot of things okay okay so we move on to the next question and i think this will go to dr sharma because he is talk so much about statistics and statistician so which which statistical tests are commonly used in medical studies to analyze data and how to decide which method should be applied for a particular analysis so i think uh, all of you can take this is a very important question dr sharma we'll start with you you will have to unmute yourself this may be a, 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 a very <laughs> important question but but there also a, a question that is most likely you know going to be uh, sort of avoided by most people to give an answer see uh, what what we are in fact talking about over here is about 60 to to about 70% of the the course content that has been created you know for for this course now uh, the the statistical methods was in fact one of them which we we have not put out here i uh, can't answer that question uh, dr this, 
this being the, the, the my first edition. So yes, uh, uh, now what sort of tests to use, where to use, is too broad a subject for, for me to uh, try and answer. Perhaps uh, uh, Prof. Sandeep Kumar has an answer to this. Yes, Prof. I'll try and do it very quickly. It's a very big question, but for the young person, see, there are two types of tests, parametric, non-parametric. Tests are done for comparison purposes. You have to compare it either with the cohort which is running parallel or in a randomized situation. You have to know that in a case control study, you get odds ratio and the confidence interval. Confidence interval is that interval in which your median value, the mean value, the mu is likely to fall. And that will tell you whether the data is significant or not, not significant. So all data will have nominal percentages, which is known as the percent, or will have proportions. So these, some of these words may not make sense to you, but you must know what is a ratio, what is a proportion, what is a percentage, what are the central tendencies. Central tendencies are mean, mode, and medians. After you've done it, then you have to see if there are two groups that are being compared, then you have to see whether the data is normally distributed. If the data is normally distributed, then you. If the data is normally distributed, then you run the t-test. T-test is paired, unpaired. If you have done before and after test, that is the same group of people have been treated or have an intervention earlier and then another intervention later, then you have a paired t-test for a data which is normally distributed. For a non-normally distributed, you use non-parametric tests like man witness u test. And then if you have a correlation data, again you have a parametric correlation, which is a Spearman correlation and a non-parametric correlation. If you are comparing an outcome with multiple predictors, then you have what is known as a multivariate analysis. So that's the answer in uh, short, but then this may appear to be a very complicated answer to the person who has asked it. But that is how one would enumerate it in five minutes. Uh, you have to learn these words. What is univariate analysis? What is multivariate analysis? What is a parametric test? What is kurtosis? What is normal distribution? If you know these words, this uh, language will start making sense to you. Uh, I, I didn't want to make use a jargon here, but that's the answer that I could best think of in five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, Deepa, do you want to uh, add something or to make it look a little more simpler? No, I think for uh, <laughs> the statistics person, I would always say that it's best to take the help of a statistician. Because as, uh, uh, as surgeons or as clinicians, there are very few people, very few of us who are totally familiar with all the statistical aspects of uh, writing a paper. And it is important to engage the statistician right in the beginning at the stage of formulating the research question. Uh, if it's a study which, in which you are trying to enroll a certain number of patients, he would be able to give you an idea of what is the adequate number of uh, patients that you need to engage, uh, uh, enroll into that study. So the help of a statistician, which most larger institutes would have, if you're not in a large institute, if you're in a private hospital, you can still find somebody in a nearby uh, uh, teaching hospital or not necessarily a, a medical teaching hospital. You can even find them in universities or colleges. There would be a department of statistics. And more often than not, I have found that if you approach a person and you find him helpful, you can then uh, interact with him and get more. And over a period of time, you would get familiar yourself on how to, uh, uh, you know, which tests are used. Okay. I think, uh, Sandeep, if there is nothing more much to add, we can move on to the next okay. question. Sure. Yeah. So there is a question that uh, if somebody is writing his first paper as a newcomer into publication, should he choose an open access journal or a journal with, uh, or a journal with high impact factor? So I think we are basically coming to this. Is open access journal better to publish or is impact factor an important determinant? No, uh, I, I think these are two different things. Open access is different from impact factor. An open access journal can have a good impact factor. 
So what I was cautioning about is the predatory journals, which you keep getting emails about, which have no substance. So open access is good when you have a good article which you want to share with the society at large. I mean, with a lot of uh, wider audience, but you need to pay for it unless your institution has a license. So everybody would like to ultimately publish or open access because it gives wide publicity to your article. But then again, the issue of cost and charges are there. So, so if you can't do that, then obviously. Uh, you go in, so the impact factor is totally different. So impact factor is again a push, uh, you know, uh, sort of a measure of your own article. How how good you think your article is, and how and what are the publication times and all. I mean, I would rather have a article published in a slightly lower impact uh, in a journal rather than a higher impact journal who takes two years. Okay? okay, so I think so. Those are the variables we have to look at. Okay, there is an important question. If if a, if some faculty has left their previous institute, and now he wants to publish their work, which they have done in the previous institute, what should be his or her affiliation, and whether newly joined institute or past institute? So uh, this is for somebody who has moved from one institution to another institution. So uh, any ideas or suggestions? Uh. <clears throat> I mean, I think the paper would get published from the institute where the author is currently. But in the in in some section, it is fair to mention that the research was carried out at at such and such place. And in these kind of scenarios, it's fair that the co-authors should be from the previous institute also, because it's not fair for a person to take a um, uh, you know a data or a pool of research which was done at an institution. And publish it from uh, another institution without any of the uh, members from the first institution being the co-author, because this is exactly the kind of thing that may subsequently lead to uh, the editorial board getting letters from uh, uh, the, the authors from the first institution that our data has been uh, taken away and it's been published without our consent or without our names uh, in the authors list. <laughs> I think there's also a different aspect to it. So, supposing one of your fellows who, who was working helped in conceptual and design, and while submission he has already moved on, I think there's this best to mention that at the time of work, he was affiliated with our own institute. So, I think that's the way it, it's done, actually. So, you write his current affiliation, but somewhere in the, you know, put a asterisk and say, at the time of uh, writing the work or in you know, a conceptualization of the research, he was working with us. Okay. Uh, another question, this is about salami slicing that we had discussed earlier. The definition of salami slicing seems a little subjective. Will the umpteen papers from SOS study, Swedish obese subjects study, be considered as salami slicing? Now that study is going on for more than 20 years and they had publications every five years uh, of follow-up. So I don't think salami slicing applies for that. It was be being discussed from one data set uh, and you have multiple publications. So is that is that the way to look at it? Any other suggestions or observations? So, so again, as I said earlier, I mean, if you, can I answer that? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no. So as I said, if you look at postgraduate thesis, which like work over two years out of the three years, we, we said strictly no to a salami slicing. No, no, absolutely no. Just publish one paper. But if it's a PhD thesis working for five to seven years, and they have several sort of verticals to their research, they're fairly okay to write several articles related to those verticals. Uh, and in case of an SOS study, it's obviously perfectly justified. It's a huge database over a number of years, and people are going to benefit. You have to look at the benefit. I mean, it's, it's going to be benefit of so many people by their you know publishing papers of that really a good database. I There's think no so. objection to that. Yeah, there is a there is a question from Dr. Vishnu. Case series study is a descriptive observational study, whereas nested case control study is an analytical study. Is it correct? No, sorry, I didn't get uh, the last part of the question. Nested and Nested case control study is an analytical study. So they are saying case series studies are descriptive observational study versus yeah. nested case control study, uh, which is an analytical study. So what what is the question exactly? I mean, what uh, is a, is a play of words? I find it difficult to comprehend. 
I, what I will do is I'll share this statement in the group and maybe tomorrow you can uh, you can go through it and and come back sure. on it. We'll do that. Yeah. Okay. And then there is a question on uh, ethical permission is part of responsible conduct of research and for safety and security of study participants. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, we're going to we're going to touch upon some of the ethical aspects uh, in in tomorrow's talk. So I think we'll we'll leave it for that. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. How can I know about index journals? So how does one get access to the list of index journals? No, instead of uh, getting looking for the uh, uh, list of index journal, I think each journal's website, when you go to the submission page or the uh, journal page, journal website itself, they would have uh, information available as to which uh, uh, authorities the journal is indexed with. So that's probably the best case to do it because that that is more likely to be uh, up to date rather than a database carrying a list of thousands of journals. Okay. Uh, this is an very basic question, but I think so relevant. Uh, Dr. Vasiya uh, Shekhaji is asking, Sir, how to decide what to write? Should, we, should it be interesting cases or rare cases or routine cases with unusual presentation? So the very concept of research and writing is being questioned. How does one decide uh, what, where, what should we write? So Dr. Sharma, would you like to... Yeah, so I go back to, to a slide that I had shown, which, uh, which talked about the three most uh, simple things to write. That starts uh, from a case report, you know, where it is. It is fairly simply, actually, uh, you know, you, you, you just talk about uh, the case report that you had uh, uh, seen and treated and then, you know, look at literature surrounding that. It's a very small format, you know, not, not too much to, I think, research or, uh, or uh, uh, well, worry about in, in terms of scientific writing. The, the second thing, like I mentioned, was the surgical technique, the, the how I do it, you know. And there I had mentioned that, that you can, in fact, talk about one small part of the operation also that you think is relevant, that makes the surgery safer, that makes, that, uh, that saves some time in the surgery, that makes the surgery simpler to do. So... That that is also something relatively simple to to well write. The third thing that that I talked about was the case series. Now the case series also should be considered fairly simple to write because the case series just talks about what you did and what you found. There is no there is no sort of question about patient selection about surgical technique, about this, that, and the other, you, you just have to report what you did and what you found. The, 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 I think, limiting factor being that you have to be very careful about conclusions that you can draw from a case series. So if it, it is only, I think, general conclusions that can be drawn from a case series. For example, this is safe. This this particular operation was found to be feasible. This this particular operation was, was found to have satisfactory outcomes in our experience. But you you cannot compare one treatment with the other with a case series. So a case series that way is is I think relatively simple to do a write up and present as well. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, we Raman, can I just add to that? Yeah, sure, Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the fundamental question uh, when you want to write something that you need to ask yourself is what is said often about uh, uh, when you speak. Are you trying to say something because you have something to say, or are you saying something just because you want to say something? You know. So the same thing can apply to writing. Do you really have a clear or a new message to convey or you want to write something just for the sake of it so that you want a publication on your name. 
and this is where the importance of studying what has been written on that topic beforehand comes into play because if you study the literature hard enough and if you say that uh, okay for example i have done this uh, case i have removed a uh, uh, you know 5 kg lipoma from somebody's back now is that going to be of interest to the readers are the readers going to learn something out of it to affect their own clinical practice is it so rare you may have done it for the first time in your life but does it mean that this is one of those cases that uh, uh, and and this is the criteria that the editors would apply also that is it something that's going to change the practice is it something so strikingly new that the reader need to know about it and if the honest question to that is no then you should probably shelve that idea so like so many things in life you will probably come up with once you start thinking on those lines you will come up with maybe 10 15 20 ideas for writing something but actually there may be just one or two worth pursuing so that that's the uh, you know sort of self control that you need to have that you don't start writing every idea that comes to your mind but do the take the time to do the search and the research to see which of them is actually worth putting to okay so i think we are on the last question and it probably is for me that says that if you are collecting the data specifically for a research question is there a possibility of missing a data point which can be significant in later studies what what should we do if this happens so my friend whoever has asked this one thing is that we are today talking about publication part of it we are not talking of the research part of it research is a is a entirely separate ball game but yes it's important so there is a difference between a registry or data keeping versus a research so if you are like what dr sandeep kumar was saying deductive analysis from data that comes from research, from the registry so if you are collecting data as part of your just a data keeping of what you are doing you can always have some deductive answers from there but typically a research must have a specific research question because and then the question of missing out point should not arise you should spend more time designing the excel sheet than interpreting it if you have designed the excel sheet very well with proper coding the interpretation becomes extremely simple so this this discussion should take place before you design the excel sheet so that you don't miss out on any point that you may repent later uh, one year or two year down the line oh god we we forgot to ask the gender of the patient or or we don't have the age of the patient which is so relevant to the your research question so i think uh, this is what i feel about this and if you have missed out on something it's really a, it's really so painful you feel miserable so it's better to spend time when you are starting a research than then at the end of it because it's easier to do that any any uh, comment sandeep you want to add something to this no, i think it's well said i think you said what it was required yeah. okay Uh, uh, uh the another question has just come now and i think this is also very relevant sir how important is author processing fee a factor in selection of a journal for publication so deepraj would you like to say this since uh, jmas does not charge indian authors for the publication but how important is to decide uh, which journal one should submit yeah Okay, so I mean, I'll give you just a little bit of a background on this as to why author processing fees uh, are charged. Uh, if you look at any journal, you know, starting with the top ranked journal, so journals often have to gen journals for running the journal have to generate revenues. So that revenue can come from several sources. It can come from societies. Today, that is becoming less and less prevalent. or the journal is with a big publishing house and the publisher is generating money by way of providing people access to uh, their full text articles that charge 30 dollars 40 dollars they are being charged the uh, so this is one way of collecting money from the readership or from the subscriber if a journal is open access it necessarily means that it is not receiving all those fees for example journal of minimal access surgery about 3 years back decided a policy that we would charge only the foreign authors certain fees to make up for the uh, journal subsistence you have to be very careful if 
a journal is asking you for fee for submission of an article more likely than not it falls into the category of what is called as the predatory journal there are several of these publishing houses coming out of or been existing out of uh, china and they are huge publishing houses they would have a journal in every specialty under the sun so there will be an international is a common uh, word with them international journal of surgery international journal of uh, gastroenterology international journal of hematology international journal of uh, 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 dermatology everything and these papers so these articles uh, these journals would ask you to pay a certain amount up front before the article is processed so the article processing fee at the end of the peer review process when it is asked it means that the journal is trying to be impartial in judging your the merit of your uh, article whether it's worthy of publication or not and the fee is charged only after the article is deemed suitable for publication so article processing fee if it is being charged up front it invariably should raise a red flag that this journal is that means going to take shortcuts as far as the peer review process is concerned and the article is going to get published you will have a publication on your on your cv but anybody who understands this nuance looks at your cv is going to say oh this article was published just because he uh, you know coughed up a uh, certain amount of money mind you these author processing fees from some of the journals could go up to about $1000 $1200 $1500 so you really have to ask yourself a question whether you want to spend that kind of money to get your article published in a not so reputed a journal okay so thank you so much uh, all the three speakers and uh, Dr. Sandeep Kumar, uh, editor of uh, Indian Journal of Surgery, for joining us today. Uh, friends, tomorrow uh, we are again starting at 4 o'clock. If you have any questions, keep sending those questions. We'll take care uh, each and every of you. This, is, this, this course is basically for medical writing. Uh, IAGS this year has started our research committee. Dr. Sandeep Agrawal and Dr. Kanagwel are the conveners for the research committee. And we are trying to create a research orientation through IAGS, and we hope to collect some data for 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 short data analysis and maybe have long term uh, uh, studies, prospective studies also in future. So thank you so much, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Sandeep Agrawal, Dr. Deepak Bandar, and Dr. Sandeep Kumar, and uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep Chaube for joining us today. And we hope to see you again tomorrow, four o'clock. Thank you. Bob. Thank you, Raman. Thank you, Dr. Thank Raman. You. Thank you. Thank you.